King to order and stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Honorable Mayor Ron Shaver. Here. Council Member Dan Marler. Here. Christine Casto. Here. Allison Howe. Here. Clint Anderson. Here. Lisa Northrup. Here. Kevin Lindell. Present. First agenda on the dot on the uh, first item on the agenda <laughs> is the uh, presentation and possible action on an application for the historic landmark designation for the property at 206 and 208 Main Street. Mr. Miller. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Included in your packet uh, is the application for the American Boarding House, which is 206 to 208 Main Address, as we've done these in the past. Um, kind of highlight a couple of the key historical details that uh, are tied to this designation. Uh, it was built in the late 1880s. This building is one of Fort Morgan's oldest standing structures, a two-story brick block styled, um, which characterized the town's early brick buildings. Um, true to form, consisted largely of corbelled brick for the building cornice and window and framements, and the first floor storefront was sheltered under a canopy which extended over the sidewalk. Building housed a number of buildings, or excuse me, businesses, among them Western Union Telegraph Office, a furniture store, the American Cafe, with the American Boarding House upstairs, uh, Wesson Arnie's Recreation Parlor, Ray's Radio Service, Warren County Radio and TV Repair, Fred's Barber Shop, Boutique of Health, The Wedding Nook, Fort Morgan Electric, and Commercial Printers. Um, be honest with you, I can't remember when we took this to historic preservation, but it was the last meeting we held and uh, felt it was time to bring it to you. But the historic uh, preservation board had no issues with the designation and recommended council approval on such a designation as well. I noticed that this description you read is for president each one of these that we're doing today. Yeah. I so, yeah. <laughs> I got a little confused. Like, did they all house Wes and Arnie's and race radio service? And probably not. It's probably how it came over from Brenda. I'll check my notes here. But so, do you know are the windows still underneath of the whatever that? With a lot of these we've done, there's questions of what's under the tin or what's under you know the repairs that have been done, and in some ways we won't know until it's taken down. Um, Lynn's been in a lot of these buildings. She's been in the upstairs that are still very functional in some ways and as they sat, you know, in yesteryears. Um, you know, the ability to really truly bring these things back to life, if you will, costs a lot of money. And so to make them, you know, accessible and truly safe to, to get into, there's some money to be spent to, to see what these things have behind the tin. Just for everybody's information, and I'm watching what entails the historic designation. I mean, what does it actually? Yeah. Do? So per the per the bylaws within the application, you see these designation criteria, and per the bylaws, they have to check and meet at least two of the criteria. And I don't think there's been a property I've brought to you yet that doesn't check the. It is recognized by historical authorities, such as listed in the Historical and Architectural Survey of Fort Morgan. Every application we brought to you is checked that box. So um, that's one of the two. And then typically the second piece in most cases is it's either been tied to an, a historic person who's made a significant impact in the community. We've seen quite a few of those buildings brought to you, or it's tied to the extinguishes or embodies distinguishing characteristics or an architectural style. Those are typically the main two that have checked the boxes to proceed. So what does it actually do? I mean, what 
benefits do they get? Or? So for purposes of grant funding, a lot of times the local designation is required um, to move into that next phase of a historical designation or it even opens funds at a state level with a local designation. Um, through uh, History <coughs> Colorado is the main entity that distributes a lot of that. Uh, the board's been working to what's called a CAG. It's a certified um, something government. Um, but what that does is will force us to modify some of our bylaws. But that CAG designation opens up the doors for even additional grant funding for historical properties that have been locally designated. Um, and so to my previous point about so many of these buildings, you know, they've got the designation, they can put a plaque on the wall and say they've been locally recognized as a historic place. Um, you know, this just opens up those opportunities to find the money that they may be interested in to improving the look of the facade on the building, um, bringing back, you know, more of the historical characteristics that existed in yesteryears. I just been had people ask, so yeah. I figured for everybody's benefit, you could explain it better yeah. than I do. And, and what are the restrictions then? If we designate it as a historical landmark, what does that mean? Can, can they renovate? Can they rip it down? With our bylaws, there's nothing tied within those bylaws that create any restrictions for them at a local level. Moving forward in the process, definitely like National Historic Landmark, um, there, there are some pretty stringent requirements on how things are renovated. It can be cost prohibitive in doing those renovations. It means after renovations occur, it's very hot in council chambers. Um, <laughs> but um, it, you know, a lot of that's, it, every designating board has their requirements. Ours, as we structured the, the landmark designation locally, it creates no issues for these property owners. Okay. We've actually spoken to some realtors over the, the recent years that have tried to sell some of our locally designated buildings and we've reassured them that your buyer's not walking into a mouse trap and buying this property and they're still able to do what they want. Now, if they wanted to pursue a grant at a national level, much more stringent check boxes and renovation requirements than we have here today. Okay. Um, our stuff, we've always said, it's gotta follow the building code and there's, you know, that's permitting processes, just because it's historic doesn't exempt you from you know, meeting with our building inspectors and building department to achieve these things as well. Okay. Your Honor, if I could, um, in answer to Council Member Lindell's question or uh, point that he made about the descriptions, there are three separate applications, but it appears, I just looked at the electronic packet and it appears that in the process of combining those all into one PDF because it was a fillable form, you're probably seeing this description three times. So if Josh could go into a little detail on the next one, it's okay. the Clatworthy building. It's completely different information, obviously. It didn't house all the same businesses. <laughs> and uh, if you want um, you know, copies of that, I can get them to you, but Josh can kind of give you a little bit yeah. of a better idea on that. Anybody else have any questions on this one? Yeah. If there are none, I'd entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on an application for historic landmark designation for a property at 206 and 208 Main Street. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. And the next historic landmark designation is for 301 Main Street. Mr. Miller. Thank you again, and if I could, that uh, last building, just out of curiosity's sake, if it exists, that one's owned by Randy Patton. This uh, 301 property is owned by Doug Barnett, um, titled the Clatworthy Building. Um, again, checks that uh, historical box for being recognized through the Historical and Architectural Survey of Fort Morgan. Uh, it's also a story, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, associated with historic persons who made a significant contribution to society or the city. It also has some uh, and embodies distinguishing characteristics of an architectural style. Clatworthy Building, located on the corner of Main Street in Kiowa, is in the third generation, or it, 
is the third generation of hardware stores built by one of the founding merchants of Fort Morgan. The original store of William H. Clatworthy built in 1885 after Clatworthy left the employment of Abner Baker, the town's first merchant, was the first store to deal exclusively in hardware and implement sales as one of the earliest buildings erected in town. Built for the reported cost of $600, the store was rather simple. Single story, 18 foot by 25 foot, located on lot 15. It housed not only the hardware business, but Fort Morgan's first post office. Clatworthy was the town's first postmaster, serving from June of 1884 to December of 1893. The hardware store was the first brick building in Fort Morgan, constructed a brick made from the first firing of Killebrew and Burke's new brickyard. The building was also occupied by G.W. G. Warner, the town's premier promoter and developer. Clatworthy soon expanded his store, building another single-story brick block on the corner lots sometime before Morgan County was organized in 1889. The Clatworthy operation continued to prosper as the town grew, and the original buildings were added onto five more times, filling the two lots in 1927. These first buildings were raised, and the present Clatworthy building was construct constructed. W.H. Clatworthy had, by that time, turned the business over to his son, Harry, incorporating in 1907 under the name Clatworthy Hardware and Company. Um, Clatworthy building represents a, a later stylistic development in Fort Morgan's business district, re reflecting the Chicago-based commercial style on a modest scale. So that's what I have on that one. And also, uh, as previous, the Historic Preservation Board approved the designation of this property at a local level as well. Okay, anybody have any questions on this one? Seeing none, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on an application for historic landmark designation for a property <coughs> located at 301 Main Street. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Kesto. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. And the final one is historic landmark designation for 305 and 307 Main Street. 305 to 307 Main is referred to as the Otis Building in the application. Uh, applicant's name or owner's name is Joanne Roan Cook. Um, checks the Historical and Architectural Survey of Fort Morgan. Uh, on the application, additionally, embodies distinguishing characteristics of an architectural style or is the work of an architect or master builder who is nationally, statewide, or locally recognized as an expert. Built by William Otis, the Otis Building is a late Victorian functional style which prevailed in Fort Morgan during the first three decades of the town's growth. The style represents the second generation of the building in town. The first, extremely abbreviated, was represented by the small frame buildings which were erected soon after the town was founded and was by far the most common stylistic expression after the first building code was enacted in 1889. The Otis Building has housed a variety of businesses, including Crouch's Dry Goods Store from 1904 to 1907, then undertaking Parlor of Joseph Yen about 1910, later the Ryland Groves Clothing Company, Schlater Tomlinson Clothing, Loom and Leather, The Style Shop, and Marion's Fashions. The building has undergone several changes at the hands of its long list of tenants, the half-timbering an addition of the canopy in 1975 has obscured the original appearance of the building. And this is uh, um, Health Center Kitchen Works area, part of town. Well, now Business Mart across the street, modern day reference. And the Historic <coughs> Preservation Board recommended this local designation as well. Okay. Questions or? Clarification. Seeing none, I'd entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution on an application for historic landmark designation for a property located at 305 and 307 Main Street. Second. I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. 
Thank Thanks, you. Josh. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda is a presentation on a proposal to adjust our natural natural gas rates based on the gas study. Front Nation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, you should in your table file have a public notice concerning the gas rates. We wanted just to let you guys know about this because of the public notice period and the time at which we want to impose the change to the gas rates. We're kind of having to notify the customers ahead of the presentation by our gas consultant. So what you have tonight is what will be going out to uh, the customers in their next utility bill at the end of the month. And one of these that shouldn't have a lot of controversy to it, we're um, doing a slight increase to the delivery charge, which is what requires the public notice and the public hearing. And then we're doing a rather dramatic decrease to the gas supply charge. So everybody's, in a nutshell, everybody's gas bills will be going down fairly significantly. Um, we wanted to put that into place the 1st of December, so we kind of had to expedite some of this. So Gas Consult will be back in two, two meetings to do his presentation, walk you through the full study, how he got to his conclusions, and then we'll have a public hearing on December 5th at that council meeting. So, but any questions, um, Mike McFadden will be back in a couple of weeks to explain how these numbers were derived. Okay. Okay. Just FYI. Just FYI for you guys. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure it'll, you know, make the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <coughs> Next is the first reading on a public hearing on an ordinance amending the planned unit development created by ordinance number nine. 71 of the city of Fort Morgan known as Riverview Commons development. This is a public hearing. Please keep public comment to the issues before city council and each speaker is asked to limit comments to time to three minutes unless the speaker represents a group of citizens in which event additional time may be allowed. Please respect these limitations as I reserve the right to limit the public comment if it is inappropriate under the guidelines or otherwise improper. I also reserve the right to limit testimony or questioning that is repetitive, cumulative, argumentative, or not pertinent to the issues. And to set a time limit on the duration of testimony if I determine it to be necessary in light of the number of people who have signed up to testify. First is the issue of legal notice. Mr. Brennan, has it been properly noticed? Yes, Your Honor, a legal notice of this public hearing appeared in the Fort Morgan Times on September 29th. Next is presentation of the ordinance. Mr. Glanmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Good evening. What you have in your packet tonight is an ordinance that would amend a previously approved plan unit development uh, known as Riverview Commons. Uh, this was originally approved back in 2003. I think you all are familiar with Riverview Commons. It's uh, near where the, uh, just west of the new Fairfield Inn Hotel that's being built currently. Actually, the Fairfield sits inside this PUD on the commercial lots. Uh, you'll see language in the PUD about commercial development, and that's really restricted to these lots to the east. Uh, where Fairfield and, and, and those other empty lots are. What we're talking about tonight are all of the undeveloped lots to the west uh, of the Fairfield Inn. So this uh, subdivision and PUD has recently been purchased by new developers and owners. They are here tonight. Uh, I'm sure they'll have comments during a public comment period. And they are uh, proposing to install units that currently are not allowed with the language in the PUD as it was originally approved and is written. So what we're doing tonight primarily is changing the lang language to allow for manufactured type homes rather than uh, what we refer to as stick built homes or, or homes built on site. Uh, I included in the packet uh, a map showing sort of where they would lay those homes out and then a pamphlet showing what those homes look like. I think, uh, you know, we're excited to see that these homes are very similar in character and, and scope to what's currently built there already. Um, so I think this uh, fits with the original intent of the PUD. Additionally, there were some other changes in the language that needed to, uh, to be modified, particularly when it comes to sprinkler systems 
for homes. Uh, it's really about impossible to get, uh, without a large cost, to get sprinkler systems inside manufactured homes. So they did ask if they could remove that provision. That's fine. I mean, it's not uncommon for us to have single-family homes built without sprinkler systems. I think it's only fair that we honor that in this uh, subdivision in PUD as well. There were some small changes to the, uh, the language as well. Removed the park, took out the dual water system, um, we do have some minimum lot sizes. There's one lot that is much smaller than the rest, and so we've got some language to take care of that. Um, we cleaned up some of the just uh, old code references and language that's in there. And then finally, I think one of the other bigger changes we have is that the applicant and owners would like the ability to have some larger homes on the lots and some larger garages that would have a common wall and go over the setback that, that we currently have in the PUD. So we did remove, uh, and Jason was great at crafting some language to allow us that every other block of lots would be able to have the ability to have a zero setback, common wall for the garage, so long as it meets the, uh, the building code and the fire code. What do you mean <clears throat> zero setback where they have and they have a common wall. Yep, so those buildings would be able to be built clear up to the property line on both sides, and then there'd be basically on either side of the garage, they have the same wall. So that's a common wall. It'd be fire rated, so if there was a fire, it didn't spread to the unit to one side or the other. But they, they, have, they have a married wall that covers both sides of, the, of two different garages on two different lots. Okay. But the garage comes right up to the property line. Typically, we require a five-foot side setback or, or such. And so you'll see the setback language in the PUD, but every other block of lots will be allowed to have a zero setback so that they can build right up to that property line. So essentially, it almost looked like a duplex with it, the garages in the middle as far as looking like pretty yep. much like one building. Okay, that is correct. I understand it. Yep. So we did take this to the uh, Planning Commission for their uh, consideration and recommendation. We did have uh, one public uh, comment at that meeting. That gentleman lives in the area, was concerned that uh, the homes would have the same character and style as what's there, and was also very concerned that we weren't allowing mobile homes into the subdivision, and that is not what we're doing. Manufactured homes are not mobile homes. They're set on permanent foundations, they have crawl spaces, this type of thing. And so he seemed satisfied after we uh, went through the public hearing. There were no other comments uh, for or against, and Planning Commission did recommend this uh, to you all for approval with these changes uh, through the ordinance that Jason has written. I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have on the matter. The three houses that are currently there, are they stick built or are they? They are, yep. And there are some lots, uh, I, I failed to mention this, that are not owned by this developer that have been retained by the bank, as I understand it, four or five lots, can't remember exactly how many. And then, of course, the three lots that are already there are also not owned by this developer. So there are a few lots that are uh, separately owned. And if I could add for council's benefit, um, and this kind of came up with planning commission, the decision tonight is whether to make these changes to the PUD, not necessarily to affect the property rights that they already have as property owners down there. So ultimately right now there's nothing prohibiting um, other than cost. There's nothing prohibiting um, the owners from putting in the manufactured home, which are factory built homes that they bring to the site, not mobile homes. Um, the cost pro prohibition port part of that is they can't add the sprinkler system in the factory. It would have to be added on site, which would involve tearing out the ceilings, putting it in, and then redoing the ceiling. So it is technically possible but extremely cost prohibitive um, so the reason I bring that up is some of the concern and angst during the Planning Commission's vetting of this issue um, was trying to control what type of development happened there the reality is they already have vested property rights to a degree the question before the council and before the Planning Commission at the time was do we allow these changes to make the development down there easier and less expensive for the developer. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Jason. Is 
anybody have any questions for Mr. Blamire? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Next, we'll hear public comments. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to this issue from the public? Please sign in on the sheet next to the Steve Griffith, I'm president of the Upper Platte and Beaver Canal Company, uh, which is just the south border of what you're talking about, the Seagull. Mm -hmm. We are actually the south side of Canal Street. Um, it was stated that this started in 03, and that's how long that this has been going on. We are close, I think, maybe, to finishing <laughs> this, but I would... Uh, I, I am just very concerned that we uh, push forward and start building before we step across the last of the hurdles that need to be done because we do have a court ruling that lets us put the ditch bank back to its original form, which would directly affect things. I mean, we're working on that right now, but I would just, I, I want to just wanted to show our concern in that. Other than that, I don't have any other concern of, of any of the and I don't think this that we're doing. addresses any or per, is pertinent to that. This is just to change the PUD usage and hope. But it I'll does allow the program to keep moving forward. I mean, it, keep, it allows the development to keep moving forward to to finish without. I mean, I'm still concerned of. The issue, underlying issues that have been going. Well, on. those are going to have to be resolved. So, so yeah, we're we're aware of that, and hopefully, we can, we can get that okay resolved. Thank so, thanks for Steve for your input. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else that wants to address council on this, Mr. Ginther? I'll make mine a little quicker. Uh, <laughs> Sign in, please. Yes, sorry. Uh, I'll do that while I'm talking so it'll go quicker. I know it's hot in here. Uh, my name is Bart Ginther and I'm the secretary on the Upper Platte and Beaver Canal. And I think our presence here tonight falls into the better late than never. Um, somehow back in 03, 04, when decisions were made that directly affected our ditch, we weren't there. So again, I would agree with you probably tonight. I don't care whether he's got uh, showers in his uh, house or um, you know, fireworks or not, that's, that's not there, but we kind of feel obligated to follow along the point. And like Steve said, um, getting the cart too far ahead of the horse could backfire on us again. So that's all I had to say. Well, we don't want backfires. This has gone on long enough, I think. So we're. Hopeful to get it all resolved. Me as well. Get something on there. Thanks for your input. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else wish to address this from the public? If there's no one else in the public that wishes to speak on this issue, and I ask the city clerk if he's received any oral or written comments at your office? No, Your Honor. We'll now proceed to the council discussion. Are there any questions from council or discussion on <coughs> council from this issue? I think this is um, definitely the direction that we need to be moving forward. Um, this has been an area of town that has just sat for many years and is not exactly an optimal, you know, entryway into our community that all of us, you know, live in. And I think moving forward and progressing forward with putting housing 
which is much needed in our, you know, in our current situation is um, very important to our community. So I'm excited to see that we are taking the steps to get there by, you know, making modifications to the PUD. And as far as the members of the ditch company's concerns of this moving forward, I, we are proceeding with <coughs> trying to resolve the issues to get this taken care of. I, I know that the PUD uh, amendments are for accommodating what they're wishing to be in there. It's not by any means giving carte blanche to, to go through. We still have to resolve this, correct? Um, yes, and I guess as I mentioned before, the issue before council today is um, whether or not these minor adjustments to the PUD uh, are appropriate. The issues with um, between the city, the ditch company, and the previous developer or current property owners, however you, you look at this, are still yet to be resolved. Um, so ultimately, that affects a limited number of the lots at this property. Uh, and further, we have done a lot of work um, between these several parties to try to come to a resolution. And ultimately, um, we're waiting to make sure all the language works for everyone. Uh, I can't. We, we as city council cannot prohibit somebody from exercising, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> cannot prohibit any property owner from exercising their uh, vested property rights, as I mentioned before, as owners of the property, they have those today, uh, regardless of this decision, uh, and they would be exercising their rights uh, as they feel appropriate. Uh, that said, these changes wouldn't necessarily affect or aren't intended to affect the ditch company and its property interests either way. This is just whether or not we allow the homes to, or require the homes to be a little bit further apart, allow them not to have sprinkling, allow them to have a shared wall on a garage, and those things. <coughs> okay. With that, does that clarify? Does anybody on council have any additional comments or questions? Yeah, I, the um, city of Fort Morgan, the state of Colorado really is in a serious housing bind. And we've had these lots just sitting vacant for a long time. And that's quite frustrating to um, residents. And uh, so I'm excited to see that uh, we've been able to make some progress on this issue and uh, very excited uh, hoping that the uh, situation gets resolved much sooner than later um, and so I'm glad that uh, that there's a lot of communication happening and I, I, I hope that we get this taken care of very soon uh, I hear from residents all the time about the housing situation that we are in and how difficult it is the rising cost of rentals and everything else and um, so the quicker we can move on resolving concerns between the parties, the better. Okay. There is no other discussion on this. I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Your Honor, I would offer a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion by Christine Casto, a second by Lisa Northrup. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Council action, Mr. Myers. All right. Council has the option to approve the changes, approve the ordinances on first reading. Um, just as a side note, the reason we're doing this by ordinance is that's what's required under the code whenever we have the creation of a PUD, which is in, a, in essence a zoning uh, function, a legislative function through zoning. We use an ordinance to do that, to create zoning or to change zoning. The code allows for minor amendments to the PUD administratively. Uh, some of these changes were large enough that we felt that we needed to go through the process of amending the PUD officially, which requires an ordinance on first reading. Um, <clears throat> if council thinks that these changes are appropriate, uh, given the nature of the area and, and the impacts on other properties, some of the same things we look at with other zoning decisions, then you should vote to approve the changes. If you feel that this is not in harmony with what should happen in on this property, you can uh, vote to deny, or I guess vote not to to have the ordinance on first reading. <coughs> Try not to make you. 
talk anymore. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> With that, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution approving first reading of an ordinance 1196 modifying the plan, the planned unit development for Riverview Commons. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Kesto and second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Your Honor, I'd like to thank uh, Jason and Steve for their hard work to get this uh, put together. I know there's a lot of moving parts to this, and one of the things that we focus on is trying to be friendly for developers so that we can get more developers into our community. And, and I know that we've done everything we can to make this work for all parties concerned. We've you know, been uh, given negotiation parameters to resolve the issue with the ditch company, and I believe we'll continue to move forward to try and make this work for everybody. But I wanted to thank Steve and Jason for their hard work on it. It was a smooth process. I thank you also. Next on the agenda is 2018 budget calendar. 2018 schedule of fees, Mr. Wells. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for your consideration tonight is a resolution which would adopt the fees that will be charged for various services in the city of Fort Morgan in 2018. This has been reviewed by staff and also presented to council at previous uh, meetings. At this point, we would recommend that council adopt the proposed uh, amendments to the schedule of fees for 2018. Uh, I would point out that at, from time to time we have to modify uh, fees in the middle of the year and the reason we have to do that is sometimes the state makes changes on fees that were required to charge for state purposes and with that uh, there could be a possibility that we amend this down the road but this is what we anticipate will be the fees for 2018. questions or comments yeah on in the packet the fees I didn't um, in the past they've been uh, highlighted red for those that receive changes is this uh, but we had received something in the packet uh, a council or two ago is right. the, the same changes as, as yes those ones? two meetings ago we presented a red line version of yeah. this same document and this is with all of those changes accepted okay yep thank you And entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution to adopt the 2018 schedule of fees. Second. A resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Christine Castell. Vote by roll call. That resolution passes unanimously. And 2018 budget calendar, formal presentation of the 2018 budget. Mr. Wells and Ms. Kinney. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Kinney is going to hand out the draft final budget. As is required under the uh, City Council's rules of procedure, uh, by the second meeting in October, we are to present a budget for your consideration and final approval. The deadline to adopt the budget is December 15th, as required under state law. And what we uh, recommend or suggest tonight is that we provide you with this draft copy of the uh, budget as we've reviewed it. There are a few minor changes that may happen between now and uh, the first reading of an ordinance on November 7th. And one of the things that we, uh, and part of the reason why we're not bringing it f as a first reading today, is that we have budgeted in there $1.9 million for road improvements that would be subject to the passage of, the, um, of 2C on the ballot. The, we didn't want to adopt a budget uh, on first reading and have second reading on the night of the final count for the election and then determine that it needed to be added or removed. So at this point, it's in there. We're waiting for the outcome of the election. And uh, then we will present next uh, meeting the first reading of an ordinance. And then if we have to modify it before second reading, uh, depending on what happens with the election, um, then we'll be able to do that before second reading. But this is uh, the line, uh, the item by item uh, budget. There are a few places in the budget where it uh, demonstrates that we might be a little bit over budget. Some of those areas will require 
uh, some spending out of reserve. Some of it will require us to cut a little bit. Like I said, this is the draft budget and we hope you'll look through it and if there are any questions when we get to first reading, we can make those modifications at the next meeting so that it's final on the second reading. But with that, I wanna thank City Council for all of your time and effort to review this budget thoroughly. Um, you know, I know it's a hard process. We start in February. Uh, we start present presentations in July that go all the way through. Uh, we go basically item by item, every department, every department manager engaged in the process. Um, and I know that it takes up a lot of your time, but I know when we're all done, we've got a good product for the community and we know that we're going the direction that council wants us to go and that the community wants us to go. So thank you for your time and efforts and, and working with staff to make this happen. And thanks to staff and all the managers that put in uh, a lot of time to review this and make sure that the expenditures that are presented in the budget are what are necessary to operate in 2018. I'd like to thank all the staff for the time they put in also. Um, they get us what we need and spending as much time as we do developing it, um, I'm sure is a, it's a smoother process than trying to slam one together in the last month or two before deadline. So um, I think it speaks volumes to the way our community works towards developing and being, maintaining our fiscal responsibilities. So. Thank you. Teach the feds. <laughs> Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, so I think you mentioned that this budget has 1.9 million for the streets? I believe so, yep. No, it does not. No, it does not. Oh, you can correct me anytime, Jeannie. Uh, I make mistakes all the time. So it does not have the 1.9. We're waiting to see in the election. Okay. So, so, so are we anticipate, because we've been contributing about 0.9 or, or $900,000 is what we have been contributing. And are we in, how much are we anticipating potentially for the streets? My, my understanding was that we were hoping to be able to get about total with our close to 1 million, uh, that we would have 2.5 million. Well, yeah, that is a very good question for clarification. Uh, the language that's in the ballot says up to $2.4 million. And the reason why we went high on the estimate, we believe it's gonna be about $1.9 million, but we went high on the estimate because if we come in over that first year's number, then we have to refund at, under Tabor. And not that a refund is bad, but trying to figure out how to refund the money becomes fairly complicated. Do we go out and do an audit of all of the sales for taxes within that year and give a percentage back to everybody that may have bought something in Fort Morgan? Do we give uh, a rebate to people just in Fort Morgan? Do we do a, a, a holiday on sales tax in Fort Morgan? There's all kinds of different ways that you have to figure out how do we rebate it and how do we make it so that it's the right amount. And that becomes uh, very uh, cumbersome on, uh, I guess, a staff level to make that happen. So we've overestimated for the ballot language. We anticipate that uh, based upon historical revenues, uh, of 1% sales tax will be about $1.9 million. And if, if I could reframe the question as I understood it, is if we get the $1.9 million in sales tax revenue um, and then the 900000 we currently spend put together, is that what the total expenditure would be? Yes, that is what it would be. So it would be like $2.8 million if we get the full one9 Okay, so the budget, when we do the budget, if it passes, we would budget the 2.5 million or the 2.8 million? Yeah. Well, to make sure I understand everything, okay. There is $900,000 in this budget for roads. Uh, if to, uh, the question 2C passes, it will be an additional between 1.8 and $1.9 million more. So the, the budget then would be the 2.8 million is what what the amended budget would yes. be if it passes yes okay yes thank you you're welcome sorry i didn't understand it right away <laughs> <laughs> so there's no action necessary on this tonight it's just a presentation is required under uh, the rules of procedure and the city charter um, with that you have your copy to review and if there are any questions let me know uh, before the next meeting so we can make those modifications if there are mistakes or other issues that need to be addressed. 
we also will have that opportunity on first reading to address any of the numbers and adjust that ordinance uh, if necessary before uh, first publication. Okay. Any other questions regarding this? We'll read it. Okay. Yeah. Consent agenda. <coughs> Ms. agenda. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. Tonight's consent agenda includes item A, approval of the disbursements and payroll for September, and item B, approval of the minutes of the October 3rd, 2017 City Council regular meeting. All items on the consent agenda are considered routine business by the Council and will be enacted with a single motion and a single vote by roll call. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is deemed necessary, that item should be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. I would entertain a resolution accepting the consent agenda as presented. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting the, the consent agenda as presented. Second. Is that you, Allison? Yes, second. Sorry, there's a question second. Here's a statement. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I have a resolution by Christine Castell and a second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Public comments for audience participation for stuff not on the count on the agenda. No. Okay. Reports by officials and staff. Thank you, Your Honor. I have a few announcements uh, and a few things to uh, bring up. Uh, first one is I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank uh, Josh Miller for doing an outstanding job for the City of Fort Morgan the last six years. You can stand up if you want. We can still see you, but you can stand up if you want. Uh, first as our recreation superintendent and then as our um, economic development and community services director. Uh, Josh has accepted employment with a private firm, Clif Clifton Larson Allen, got that one right, and uh, will be leaving us on November 3rd. Uh, Want to thank him for all of his hard work. I'm sure we'll see him around uh, because of what he's going to be doing uh, in that job. Well, I'm sure we'll continue to see him around and I know his family's going to be here for a few months. Josh, if you'd like to come up and take a few minutes to uh, <coughs> say your last imparting words, but just know that we really appreciate you and all the work that you've done for the city of Fort Morgan. I appreciate that. Um, thank you to all of you. It's been uh, a wild five and a half years. Um, some uh, a shorter run than others, but I've known most <laughs> of you for the entire time I've been here with the city. Um, you know, piggybacking on when I was here last on our budget presentation, I'd like to believe we've got a lot done and met a lot of your goals as they were laid out for not only myself, but the departments that I've worked for. But uh, you guys are in good hands. And uh, interesting 10 days, 15 days in my life as I've looked into the crystal ball to see what my future holds. But uh, when I got that call on September 13th, I didn't know life would kind of change as I know it. So. Um, Thank you all for all of your support. Uh, family will be in town here through the summer, so see more of you uh, as I'm back visiting them. So, but thank you all for all of your support over the years. Thank Thanks, you, Josh. Thank best you. of luck in your endeavors. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. And we, we did discuss this that uh, if by you know January for whatever reason he uh, wants to come back, he's leaving on good terms. So, you know, we'll see see how the commute goes. Anyways, but thanks again, Josh. We appreciate it. Um, the other thing is I, I will be leaving uh, on Friday to go to the International City Managers and Counties Association um, National Conference. I got a scholarship from the Colorado chapter that will cover all my costs to go down and, and attend this for the first time. I'm really excited about it. So uh, that's where I'll be. Call me. I'll still have my phone if you need anything. Um, the other thing is I've had a lot of comments uh, and uh, comments, questions about the sugar factory. I know some of you have as well. Um, we're working with the sugar factory on every level that we can. Obviously, it's not within our jurisdiction, but we're trying to assist them uh, in various ways, and we'll be coming back to council if additional assistance is needed. I know that I've had a lot of um, citizens question about, you know, are they going to fix the, the issues? There's, there's mud on the roads. It looks like a dirt road. I've talked to to the CEO about that. They were supposed to put in, according to their um, <coughs> permit from the county, mud knockoff racks. They didn't get those put in. Uh, he said they're working on it. There's several other cosmetic 
clean up things that uh, were said would be done in public meetings that haven't been done. And I've talked to them about that. I know that they're working really hard to try and get this uh, beet season underway. If, as you notice, we have mountains of beets arriving and uh, they are processing and they believe that they're gonna have the odors under control. Uh, so we'll see how everything works out. I know that uh, they've been working with the Colorado Health Department and they've been working with uh, state representatives to try and figure out uh, how they're going to make this work. But, um, you know, we lack a lot of jurisdiction to do anything, but I know we, it directly impacts the, the people here in Fort Morgan. I know there's a lot of concerns and I just wanna let council know we're listening to those concerns, but there's very little that we can actually do uh, to, to promote what's going on. So if you have any questions or people have questions about what we're doing, I can definitely fill you in, but uh, we're not ignoring the problem and the issue. We're doing what we can in our limited capacity. So are we able, sorry, Go ahead. are we able, so um, I know you're working on it from all the angles you can. I think it would be awesome if council could formally invite the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to kind of have some kind of presentation that city members, anyone who lives in the area can contend and ask questions. I love it because they can offer a more objective perspective because they've kind of had a history of recording um, like particulates in the air just, so maybe we could invite them to do a formal presentation, kind of a Q&A. Well, I, I know that one of our local citizens had uh was interested in that and had called them. Uh, but that, if, if that's something the council would like to do, uh, I could reach out to the health department and have them come down to Fort Morgan and, and do a public presentation where they, uh, the public could ans ask questions and, and find out you know, what the state's been doing. I mean, that's something that we don't really get a lot of information on. Uh, I don't know if they'd be willing to, but if that's something council would like to see done, we could put that together. But. I, want direction from council before we did that. So. I think that's in the state or the health department's hands. They're going to authorize or not authorize. I mean, that they're working with it. And I know working with through the wastewater, the water aspects, and going through the EPA um, educational process that I did, that and could ask them, but I highly doubt they're going to do it because it's between that entity and them, not us. <coughs> so what I could do if, if council is okay with this is I could at least call them and see if they're willing to do it. If they're not, they're not. If they are, then I'd, you know, come back to council and see, or we can just leave it alone. It's up to... I think just let them, they're working with them, they're working on it. So, I mean, it's. Where are we at as far as our discussion with them? You know, their water utilization after their remodel jumped up dramatically and everything. Where are we at as far as working that out with them? We, we have been in negotiations and discussions with them. Um, we've basically given them the similar uh, treat, the same treatment that we have other corporations and businesses that have exceeded their water capacity and they provided us with a, I haven't seen it yet, but they, they're going to provide us with a written um, plan. Uh, we met with them, I think it was the last week or two weeks ago and they're, they're still putting together the written plan that we discussed on what they're going to do to reduce, either reduce their water over the next uh, season or uh, we'll be working with them to buy additional water rights to make up for the difference. And are we still in the same situation that if constituents have issues, um, their, I don't remember if it's an 800 line, there's still their phone line that's available and if constituents have issues that they want to um, address that we as council with our limited ability, they are more than welcome to reach out to their um, Morgan County commissioners. Yes, uh, yeah, the Morgan County commissioners do have jurisdiction over what's happening there. Uh, as well as the state. We do have that number and we can put that out on our Facebook, the, the number that you can call. Um, and we can put on our website, the number that you can call if you have any concerns or questions uh, as a citizen. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, if, 
if they want to contact us, we can relay that information. But right now, the county's required them to set up a hotline number as part of their permit where they receive and document all calls and those calls are then provided on a quarterly basis to the city and the county. But I haven't seen that log yet. So I know they're supposed to be doing it. So you're, oh. I was just going to ask if you could clarify what you were thinking as far as the health department coming out. I mean, what do you envision? Is this just a general public meeting or are you talking about having them come here to council? Right. Um, so just history. So when I've emailed um, the staff members who are at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment who are over the air quality for this plant, I haven't received responses. Um, so I know what... Um, the mayor talked about how the EPA and the CDPHE do have, you know, conversations going, but they also are accountable to us as citizens. So I feel like if we have a meeting, we can invite them as city council, but having it definitely open forum where they, yeah, where we can ask them questions about what our rights are as far as air quality and water quality are, and then maybe, yeah, I don't know how it would look as far as um, what they'd be willing to present, but as far as having a representative, because um, they do have a representative that's specifically over that plant. So, um, and it's a government employee, they're receiving tax dollars. And so, yeah, when we get a question mark and an empty response, I feel like it's really important to have them part of the conversation, not on the business end, but on the citizen end. So I guess it, it could be here, it could be at the library, it could be at the high school. I think your point, though, what, what you said in your comment, though, is I think it really, in my, in my opinion, it needs to be a separate meeting or gathering from council. Yeah, because be. I think it would, I mean, if, if right. I don't think we as a city should reach out to have them come out, but I think we as individual citizens in the city of Fort Morgan have every right to ask for them to come out, but I think from a city council person perspective, I think that's bordering on overstepping where our, um, what was the word you used, our jurisdiction, our jurisdictional lines, you know, and, you know, we don't, we don't want to set this up so it looks as though the city of Fort Morgan is not, you know, agriculturally friendly. We don't want, you know, people that are in our community thinking that the city of Fort Morgan is anti-farming. And so I think we have to walk that very delicate line you know, of what's, you know, air quality. So I think that would have to be letter writing campaigns and individual um, city, um, and I, what's what I'm looking for, <laughs> individual city um, citizens, you know, would have to do that. I, I think it really shouldn't be separated from what we're doing as a council, just in my opinion. I agree. Well, and like the mayor said, I know that they're working on it, try and make this thing go forward but as the concerns come forward we're doing everything we can from the city's perspective to what limited things that we can to, to help the situation so. um, anybody else have any announcements uh, yes John. I just have one uh, report I wanted to make I put a copy of this document in your council uh, in your table files but there was a withdrawal of a candidate from our city council election today obviously way too late to be um, taken off the ballot so I have notified the county clerk who uh, runs the coordinated election um, and had him sign a notarized withdrawal form and so um, he may get some votes, but they won't count is basically how it will work. Um, so he has withdrawn from the race. It's John Steinbaugh in Ward 2. Is that it? Anybody else? I think that's it. Thank you. Bids, meetings, and announcements. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. The city is currently accepting uh, sealed bids for fitness equipment until 2.45 p.m. on October 25th and requesting statements of qualifications and experience from consulting firms qualified and experience in the field of airport engineering services until November 3rd. Uh, under meetings, the Golf Course Advisory Board is scheduled to meet tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. at Quail Dunes. 
The Heritage Foundation is scheduled to meet October 26th at 4 p.m. at the Museum Community Room. And the next City Council regular meeting will not be until November 7th here at City Hall at 6 p.m. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the next two Coffee with a Cop sessions have been scheduled. Uh, one will be October 26th at MCC Student Center. The other one will be at Cafe Lotus on October 31st. Both are from 9 to 10 a.m. And a Halloween party for seniors on Halloween day, Tuesday, October 31st from 1 to 3 p.m. That's free and costumes are encouraged. And they're also uh, taking um, reservations for a 101st Army Band concert on Veterans Day, actually the day after the actually actual Veterans Day on Saturday, Friday is the observed. More information on all that is available on the city's website and also the city has opened a free 24-hour RV dump station at the city complex parking lot. Um, and it's kind of south of the senior center. Um, there are bottles <coughs> preventing people from running over the water faucets and things like that but it's free open to the public open 24 hours and under camera surveillance all that time has it been used mm -hmm. it has i've had a lot of compliments on it it's getting used quite a bit Good. but we wouldn't we would notify the public that the water over there isn't for filling up water jugs that's no. that's uh not the appropriate place to be filling up water jugs so yeah <laughs> Be that as it may. Be that as it may. It's, that's not <laughs> what it's for. So. <laughs> okay. With that, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategies for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CSR section 24-6-4024E and for the following additional details provided for identification purposes, uh, ep economic incentives. I'd entertain a motion. Your Honor, I would like to make a motion that we go into executive session. Second. I have a motion by Christine Casto, a second by Lisa Northrup. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We will adjourn to executive session. <laughs>